And here's the third shift. More searching, relevant, and even politically urgent content can be found in graphic novels published by divisions of large corporations. Consider, for example, the recent footnotes in Gaza by Joe Sacco, published by Metropolitan Books, uh, which is uh, a division of Holt, which is a division of Macmillan. Uh, what is used to be called comics like the alternative, but clearly the old terms have become inadequate. In comic book shops, critical successes like Sacco, huge commercial successes like Spiegelman or Mario Satrapi are considered alternative. Mouse has sold millions of copies. I'm not sure what's alternative about that. If you see the language we've inherited, we inherited from fandom and from a specific market or sphere. In a larger context, but beyond the narrow frame of the superhero and its related genres, uh, the term is misleading. So in sum, if one expects independent publishing to yield truly independent or even dissident content, one's bound to be disappointed by the periodical comic magazines um, in North America today. But a proliferation of other types of comics, including graphic novels, broadsheets, tabloids, artist books, web comics, all of these, uh, this proliferation indicates that independent comics are not declining. In fact, they're simply dissolving outward, away from the comic book shop, away from the traditional floppier comic book form, and into more diverse channels. Increasingly, alternative cartoonists are making comic books out of love rather than necessity, if they make them at all. And they're redefining a comic book as a handcrafted or limited edition art object. In other words, among alternative artists, the distinction between a comic book and mini comic is fading. Now, some will argue in this current digital era that mini comics, and you can see an example here, this is a rack from uh, Quimby's books for Chicago. Some will argue that mini comics in general are now retreating in the face of online culture. This is what the critic Douglas Wolfe said to me. Um, Douglas remarked that minis, and I quote here, have all but been made obsolete by digital stuff. Uh, he went on to say that unless they have some kind of handmade or objet dark quality, they seem like a wasteful and counterproductive means of exhibiting work these days. Now, I would argue that he is defining mini comics too narrowly. Uh, and that indeed it's that very handmade or objet d'art uh, quality that dominates minis today. Mini comics, I don't know if the phrase is even current here in this language, right? Did we speak of mini comics? Right? I don't, I don't know. Any, any, anyone? Mini comics, essentially, usually they're photocopies. Sometimes they're offset, then usually they're right? um, the, the, the term of choice in Britain used to be small press. It's very often applied that something was photocopied. Right. Um, and the prevailing term in the U.S. and Canada is minis. Um, in mini comics is now a category that includes standard-sized comic books and sundry other types of objects. Increasingly, the term mini designates not a publication's format or size, but its limited distribution. In any case, uh, evidence leads me to believe that the mini comics movement, but that is what it is, it's a movement, it's an art movement, continues to thrive as a tactical print-based alternatives to digital culture. Again, the repopulation of paper. The handmade, often personalized mini as a unique and erratic art object seems to be having a renaissance. Many comics more than ever are a, are a publishing and printing uh, And again, to paraphrase Ian from the other day, uh, a hat of art. But there need be no tug of war between many comics and digital culture. In fact, there's a powerful synergy between the mini comics movement and digital culture. Um, proponents of many, such as uh, the great John Porcelino, now feel a renewed enthusiasm for them precisely because online communication has made it so much easier to promote and distribute them. Meanwhile, comics native to the web, original web comics, appear to offer the one very dramatically expanding platform for new cartoonists. And thus they are now often touted as the democratic alternative to the sort of ossified direct market on the one hand and the forbidding graphic novel genre on the other. The question, of course, is how do many comics pay? Right? That still remains a difficult question. How to monetize them, as one retailer put it to me. Many web comics, such as Kate Beaton, earn money through book collections and merchandising while giving their new comics away online for free. You can go to harkabaker.com and read kinds of wonderful uh, scripts by Kate Beaton there, for example. Um, 
Banner advertising on webcomics is no longer uncommon, and it's even expected on webcomics portals. If you go to a webcomics portal or hub that hosts a lot of webcomics, you will almost always find a banner or sidebar ad of some kind. Without doubt, webcomics constitute robust business and a distinct culture, uh, which only partly overlaps with comics culture at large. Um, it has its own history and social etiquette. Many of the best known web comics have been published continuously for more than a decade. My niece and nephew, now in their mid 20s, tell me they've been reading web comics for close on 15 years. I go to them to find out what's interesting and good uh, in that area. Um, web comic hosting has become a business uh, in itself, as one can see from some of these screenshots here. Um, However, I would argue that web comics that explore, explore the medium in, uh, uh, or, or the comics form rather, in a, in a medium specific way, and I'm thinking here of Scott McCall's so called infinite canvas, which we've heard about repeatedly here over the last few days, I think those are actually a few. Formalistically speaking, the prototype of the web comic is a repurposed newspaper strip, right? an old standby now revived for digital readers. Nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, uh, there are web comics portals that welcome alternative work, work that's alternative in form, as well as thematic content. Things like Activate or What Things Do. Uh, but I noticed that the comics on those sites appear to be aiming for print, ultimately, as if digital were just some kind of useful stock. Yeah, look at the way virtual page designs persist in these web comics, for example. Um, certainly, web comics have become vitally important as an alternative to print, but they also serve, and I think this is crucial, as handmaidens print. Okay. Um, bearing out Eric Reynolds' observation, uh, Reynolds works for Panographics, that print and digital eventually will work in conjunction with each other and prove to be complementary rather than absurd. So in light of all this, the status of independent comics uh, in uh, predominantly English-speaking North America, in Canada and the U.S., is ambiguous. Okay. Uh, the time has long since come when very few comic book stores will bother to carry food as well as treehouse or horror. And when the logical place to find Adrian Tomine or the Hernandez brothers is probably a bookstore or an online seller rather than a comic shop. That time has long since come. But it's hardly the time of artistic retreat in North America. It's hardly the time of artistic retreat. Truly alternative comics appear to be thriving in a greater variety than ever before. It's just dizzy. It's incredibly difficult to keep up. They're distributed now through myriad channels, including, of course, increasingly online. 